Let me encourage you to get your Bible out and open and follow along as we consider God's Word together. And uh, we'll be basing the message out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. So if you would find 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll begin reading there in just a moment. But of course, there's been much talk in the news lately about death. The coronavirus is not near as deadly as first predicted. I mean, early on they were estimating as many as 2 million Americans dying from this pandemic. But of course, it's nowhere near that. And uh, the death rate, if you look at the numbers they're showing, is something like 3%. But it's even lower than that because you have to keep in mind, you can't have an accurate death rate unless you know who all has had the virus. Uh, the percentage they're showing is based on confirmed cases, but there are many people who will have it that will never know it. And so, unless you know who all's had it, how can you figure an accurate death rate? And not only that, it's been it's been proven that there are deaths being counted in this death toll on the coronavirus. That there are people that it was never even confirmed they had the coronavirus, but they may have had symptoms. Most of the people that are dying from this uh, or with this, they, they, they have major health problems already. And so if someone dies and they've had some symptoms, they're actually counting cases like that. And so it's not accurate. But the media has been working so hard to portray it as one of the deadliest plagues that has ever afflicted mankind. I mean, if you just watched the media and that was your only source of information, you would come away thinking this is the worst thing we've ever dealt with. But, you know, I'm just so sick and tired of the hypocrisy. You think about the news media and you think about how they're acting about this, and yet, what about abortion? How many innocent babies in their mother's womb are murdered every day in this country? Media doesn't, doesn't cry about that. They're not concerned about that. In fact, they want to protect that so-called right. And what about all the other things we can talk about? Do you realize that on average in America every year, about 650,000 people die because of heart disease. About 600,000 die because of cancer. And you can go right down the line. But what about this issue of alcohol? On average in America every year, over 80,000 people die in alcohol-related deaths. Where's the concern? People try to avoid the reality of death. But the media has been keeping a death toll, as they call it, in front of people nonstop. And they're trying to keep that in front of them uh, to scare them. There's a reason why they're doing that. And that's another message for another time. I, I tell you, I have, I'll be honest with you, I have some strong uh, opinions about what all's going on. But I don't think that you've tuned in to hear my opinion. Uh, you you want to hear the Word of God, and I'm going to get to that. I'm just trying to make a point here. Um, they, there's a reason a lot of this stuff is going on. There are various things really going on, various factors. And you just need to think about some things and, and use some discernment. But anyway, my point is this. They're creating this panic because most people, most people fear death. And they don't, they don't want to think about it, but they're being forced to think about it. And perhaps that's a, a good thing because you need to face you need to face the reality of death. My friend, the reality is that of those born of this world, the death rate is a hundred percent. You're not likely to die of the coronavirus, but you'll die of something else. Now thank God for the exceptions. You know, there are going to be believers alive when Christ comes for the church, the body of Christ. And we're going to be caught up to meet Him in the air without dying. And I, I, I hope to be in that number. <laughs> that doesn't even have to die at all. That just be caught up and changed. But we don't know when the Lord's coming. And you need to prepare for this reality and face this reality. The death rate is 100%, generally speaking. And you need to face this because you're not really ready to live until you're ready to die. 
think about this. Now, I've got good news for you. I've got good news for you. The good news is that Jesus Christ conquered death. And He gives victory over death to all who receive Him. Let's begin reading here in 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. Let's begin reading in verse number 50. The Apostle Paul writes and says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now he's talking about the kingdom of God in the broader sense of the, the, the spiritual eternal sense of God's kingdom. And God's purpose for the church, the body of Christ, is to reign with Christ in His heavenly kingdom. Well, we can't do that with a flesh and blood body that's corrupt. We're going to have to get a new body. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, that we're going to get a body that is eternal in the heavens. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul, writing by inspiration of God, said, I, show you a mystery. A mystery in the Bible is a divine secret that cannot be known until God reveals it. Well, my friend, uh, resurrection, bodily resurrection is no mystery. Uh, the oldest book in the world, the book of Job, talks about bodily resurrection. So what does Paul mean here when he said, I show you a mi mystery? Well, bodily resurrection is not a mystery, but the church, the body of Christ, is the great mystery unknown to the prophets. It was a secret hidden God first made known to Paul, so therefore our resurrection is a mystery. He's talking about the hope of the body of Christ. That's a mystery revealed to him. He said in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. When he's talking about our hope, he said, this we say by the word of the Lord. He's not quoting Old Testament scripture because he got a new revelation about our hope to meet the Lord in the air. We're not all going to sleep. Sleep is talking about physical death. It's called a sleep because it's temporary. The body goes in the ground, but it'll come up when the Lord comes. It's just temporary. A believer that dies, they go to be with the Lord in heaven. The body uh, goes in the ground, but it'll be resurrected and they'll be reunited with their body and have a new body. But they're going to be believers alive on the earth when the Lord comes that won't have to die. We'll just be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, you got to keep in mind here some things, because a lot of people get confused on a verse like this, because they see things in the Bible that are similar, and they jump to the conclusion that they're the same. Uh, for an example, over in the book of Revelation, you got seven angels with seven trumpets. Well, just because Paul mentions a trumpet... Doesn't mean he's talking about what's going on in the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation has to do with the day of the Lord. It has to do with prophecy of things that are coming after this age ends. It's not about the body of Christ in this age of grace. It's about the consummation of the prophetic kingdom program of Israel. That's what the book of Revelation is about. And he didn't say the last trumpet. He said the last trump. The trump is the sound a trumpet makes. And he didn't say seven trumpets. He said the trumpet. Over in um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, it's called the trump of God, not of an angel. The trump of God. God's trumpet, the trumpet shall sound. And there's going to be more than one sound. The first sound, uh, there's an order to this. And there's, and there's going to be more than one sound because he says the last trump. But he said the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Now, I love that, changed. We shall be changed. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 3.20, Our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. What kind of body will it be? It'll be like 
the body Christ had after he rose from the dead. It was a body by which he could go from earth to the third heaven just like that. Um, it was a body that he could walk out of the tomb before the stone was rolled away. The stone wasn't rolled away to let him out. The stone was rolled away to show his disciples he wasn't there. And so Paul talks about this body in 1 Corinthians 15, back up in verse number 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first. And, and, and notice, by the way, he says the last Adam. Christ is not the second Adam. He's the last Adam. You have the first Adam who sinned and wherefore is by one man sin entered the, the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sin. That's Romans 5.12. And Romans 5 in the latter part of the chapter contrasts the two Adams. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, came to redeem what the first Adam ruined. And Paul said in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so the last Adam, he calls him, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We're going to be changed. We're going to have that image of the heavenly. We're going to have a body fashioned like unto the glorious body of Jesus Christ. In a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. You see, there is a difference in the word of God between the blessed hope of the body of Christ... And the second coming of Christ to the nation Israel. In other words, our hope was revealed, a mystery revealed to Paul. There's no signs for it. It could happen any moment. It is at hand, Paul said in Romans 13 and Philippians 4. Uh, so it's imminent. And uh, we're looking for Christ. We're not looking for the signs of the times. And we're not looking for the Antichrist and all of that. We're looking for Christ from heaven. He could come today. He's going to come before the 70th week of Daniel can be fulfilled. But the second coming of Christ to the earth is after the 70th week of Daniel. The 70th week of Daniel is a seven-year period leading up to the second coming of Christ. That's the subject. Look, the second coming of Christ is the subject of much prophecy. But our hope was a mystery. These are two different things. He said, verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. What a statement. Now Paul's making an application from Isaiah 25, 8. If you go back and study that verse in context, it's not talking about the resurrection of the body of Christ because we were a mystery unknown to the prophets. But you notice he did not say, then shall be fulfilled. He said, no. He said, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. He's taking a saying out of prophecy and applying it spiritually to us. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And I believe he's alluding again to Hosea 13, verse 14. He's alluding back to prophecy, but he's making a spiritual application. But I love the way he taunts death here. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. But look, Christ took the sting out of death for us. Because He took away our sins. Death can't hold us. It couldn't hold Him. He took away our sins. He paid for our sins. He rose in victory. The sting of death is gone. He said the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Think about that. I mean, that's a statement these legalistic churches all around, don't. I guess, have never read. You put people back under the law, it's putting them under bondage, Paul said in Romans 6, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. 
So the strength of sin is the law. The problem is not the law. The problem is the flesh. And the law can't change the flesh. That's why we need to be made a new creature in Christ. Under grace, we have the victory. He gives us by grace what we could never earn by the law. Verse 57, but thanks be to God which giveth us. Giveth us. Which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that word, victory. I'm on the winning side because I'm in Christ. I have the victory. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But God gave it to me by grace. And then notice how he ends the chapter, verse 58. Therefore. Now, what's going on here in 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul is correcting false doctrine that denies bodily resurrection. And now that he's straightened it out and given the sound doctrine, therefore, in other words, on the basis of correcting false doctrine and, and on the basis of now teaching sound doctrine, therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we believe determines how we behave. Knowing about our hope, knowing about our resurrection, we ought to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's not in vain. Our labor's not in vain in the Lord. In chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, go back to verse number 32. If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. There are people there at Corinth denying bodily resurrection. Paul said if there's no resurrection, then what's the point of what we're going through? We're suffering uh, to preach the risen Christ. We're suffering uh, for the work of the ministry, but what advantage is it if there's no resurrection? Why don't we just eat and drink and tomorrow we'll die? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, he's saying, you communicating with these false teachers... And you listening to their false doctrine, it's corrupting the way you live. False doctrine, when it's believed, produces ungodliness. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 16 is an example of that, where Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and in the context, by the way, he's dealing once again with false doctrine concerning the resurrection. But he said in 2 Timothy 2, 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. But sound doctrine, when it's believed, produces godliness. 1 Timothy 6, 3, Paul talked about the, uh, the truth which is after godliness. I believe he said something similar in Titus chapter 1. And there are verses where you can see if you believe sound doctrine, it'll produce godliness. 1 Timothy 6, let me read the verse, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's talking about the words that Christ spoke through him, into the doctrine which is according to godliness. I believe it's in Titus 1 where he talks about the truth which is after godliness. But the doctrine which is according to godliness. What a statement. So what we believe affects us in so many ways and that's why doctrine is so vital that we reject false doctrine and we get rooted and grounded in sound doctrine. Now, I like what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The body of Christ is God's eternal purpose, it says in Ephesians 3, planned before the world began, but kept secret until first revealed through Paul. He said, but is now made manifest, verse 10, by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. But what a statement. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Christ conquered death. Now death still goes on. As a believer, 
You could die before the Lord comes, but look, there's no sting in death. Uh, it's, it's a sleep because your body sleeps, not the soul. The soul goes to be with the Lord. You're going to be with Christ, which is far better, but that body's coming up. And there is coming a day. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And in Revelation 20, we read where death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. There's an order to resurrections in, uh, in the Bible, uh, resurrections to come. And there's a big study on that. So he abolished death. He won the victory over death. But it's a matter of time. In other words, uh, not everything is being fully carried out yet in that the resurrection of the body of Christ hasn't happened yet. Uh, the first resurrection in prophecy uh, at the second coming of Christ, uh, the resurrection of the just, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but Christ has accomplished it. I mean, it's a done deal. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 11, he's abolished death. And again, if I drop dead right now, I'm going to be with the Lord immediately. I'm with the Lord in heaven, and this body, it will come up and be changed. So I do have the victory. Christ abolished death. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Now think about that statement. I mean, the devil's no match for the Lord. Satan had the power of death. But Christ brought redemption. How did he do it? Through death. In weakness. In other words, in dying, he defeated the devil. In dying, he defeated the devil. Think of that. Through death, he might destroy him that had, past tense, the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Say, look, the Lord Jesus Christ went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and he defeated him. Uh, on that cross, he's not the victim, he's the victor. Colossians 2 said he triumphed over them in it. And he was in complete control and he gave up the ghost when he wanted to. And it, he, he laid down his life and he took it back up again. The Bible said that Christ raised himself from the dead, the Father raised him from the dead, and the Spirit raised him from the dead. You can find verses on all three members of the Godhead. God raised him from the dead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But he destroyed, through his death, burial, and resurrection, the devil. Well, the, the devil, though, hasn't been executed yet. He hasn't been cast into the lake of fire yet. So Christ did abolish death, but the last enemy hasn't been destroyed yet. I mean, it's already a done deal. It's just a matter of time. And same thing with the devil. Uh, he's already a defeated foe. It's just a matter of time before he gets thrown into the lake of fire. Praise the Lord for that. It'll happen. Amen and amen. And he said in verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This bondage of the fear of death. If you trust Christ, you don't have, to, you don't have that. You have, you have victory. And uh, I think about what the Lord Jesus, in Revelation 1, what it says about the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. You see, Satan had the power of death, but he don't have it no more because Christ went toe-to-toe -to -toe and whipped his tail, and he rose from the dead, and he has the keys of death and of hell. And so if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the victory over death. Again, the dead in Christ, those who die before the Lord comes, they go to be with the Lord. You don't have to fear death. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why is it gain? He said in verse 23, To depart and be with Christ is far better. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4.6, I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Death is a departure. It's not a ceasing to exist. It's not a soul sleep. No, you're conscious. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. I mean, your conscience after you die, I think he's referring to his death, uh, that he, you know, he died 
He was left for dead in Acts 14. I believe that's what Paul's referring to there in 2 Corinthians 12. And he was caught up to the third heaven. He's talking about that experience. But you're conscious. You're conscious. And, uh, you know, I've got a message here on the YouTube channel where I preach on this. I'm not going to stop and deal with all this. But the fact of the matter is, you, you go back to the book of Genesis. When her soul was in departing for that, she died. The scripture says... Um, there, you know, you have this issue of in death your soul departs. Okay, where does it go? Well, if you're saved, it goes to be with the Lord. If it's lost, you're going to hell. That's the plain truth of the matter. But if you're saved and you die, you, you, you go to be with the Lord. And Paul had absolute assurance of salvation. He said, I'm ready to be offered. They're about to cut his head off and he knew it, but he, he had peace. He said in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I mean, he had absolute peace about it, absolute assurance about it. He was ready to go. Are you ready to go? If you die today, are you going to be with the Lord? If you're saved, you are. So we don't have to fear death, but death is not our hope. I'm not looking to die. I'm looking to live. I'm looking for the Lord to come before I die. I'm looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. I'm looking for my Savior from heaven, Philippians 3.20. I'm looking for Christ. I'm not looking to die. I'm looking to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Lord could come today, and when He does, the believers who are alive, we're going to be caught up to meet Him in the air without ever even having to die. What a wonderful truth. But if I die before He comes, I'll go to be with Him. And then my body will be raised when he comes. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1. And spend a little time here in this chapter. This is known as the great resurrection chapter. Whole chapters in the Bible are given to vital subjects. Uh, the longest chapter is right in the midst of the Bible, Psalm 119. And um, it's all about the Word of God. That's the most important subject because, you know, that's the basis of our faith. Faith is believing what God said. Oh, what do you know about the resurrection if you don't have the Word of God? So here you have a whole chapter on the resurrection and how vital that is. You've got a whole chapter on faith, Hebrews 11. You've got a whole chapter on charity, 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, Paul said without charity we're nothing. So that's, that's vital. Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's vital. Whole chapters are given to vital subjects. But here in 1 Corinthians 15, the first part of the chapter, Paul proves that Jesus Christ is risen bodily from the dead. And then he goes on in the latter part of the chapter to prove that because Christ is risen, His people will also rise. We'll be raised bodily from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is an absolute fundamental of the Christian faith. Absolutely essential. There is no Christianity without it. And uh, so it's not an optional doctrine whatsoever. It's a fundamental of the Christian faith. It sets Christianity apart from all other religions. All other religions have founders that died and are still dead. Christ rose from the dead. That's who you should trust. You should put your trust in the one that rose from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sadly, though, there are some that claim to believe in the resurrection of Christ, but their trust is in their own works for salvation. I think about the Roman Catholic Church. They teach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead the third day, but then they preach that you have to join their church and do the traditional things they do, and you have to do works if you're going to have any hope of salvation. In other words, they know the facts of the death, burial, and resurrection, but they're not trusting the death, burial, and resurrection for their salvation. No, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection, trusting in Him and Him alone what He accomplished for salvation. It's not of works. It's by grace that we're saved. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, what does he mean by that? That if makes a lot of people nervous. Well, here's the gospel. He's about to state the gospel, the gospel by which we're saved. And he said, you've received it. But why does he say if? 
And if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. And he's going to explain what he means in this context down in verses 12 through 18. He's going to show that if Christ isn't raised, then their faith is vain. See, he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to these people, but now they're listening to false teachers saying there's no resurrection. So he's making the point, if there's no resurrection, then you've believed in vain. He said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen. All right? Now, here it is. Here's the gospel. He said, I received. How did Paul receive it? He said in Galatians 1, 11, and 12, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the grace of God was a divine revelation made known first to the apostle Paul. You say, well, if that's the case, how come Paul said it was according to the scriptures? Well, you notice he said according he didn't say fulfilled, he said according. In other words, according means agreeing and harmonizing with. The fact that Jesus Christ would die, be buried, and rise again, that, that agrees with what the Scripture says. I mean, it was prophesied that Christ would die and rise again. But the full meaning of what he would accomplish through his death, burial, and resurrection as it pertains to the justification of the body of Christ and building the church, the body of Christ. That was a mystery. In other words, this gospel was revealed to Paul. Paul is the first one to glory in the cross and preach it as good news because he got the revelation of all that was accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, if the princes of this world would have known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But Paul got this revelation. Christ died for our sins. Just five words, but how powerful. And you know, that three-letter word right in the middle is so vital because you can know historically that Christ died. You can accept that as a historical fact. And you can be honest and know that you're a sinner. But you're not saved until you realize and believe in your heart that He died for our sins. That on the cross... He was dying our death as our substitute, as our sacrifice. He shed His blood and died for our sins. You've got to realize that you're a lost sinner and you can't save yourself. There's no works you can do that God's going to accept. But the good news is when Jesus died on that cross, He was made sin for us and He paid the price of our sin in full with His precious blood. And He died. You've got to take that personal now. You've got to know He died for you. That He died for our sins. That He was buried which confirms that he died. The fact he was buried three days and nights, he didn't just faint on the cross, he died on the cross. And he was buried and rose again the third day. A dead Savior can't save anybody. If he wouldn't have rose from the dead, we couldn't be saved. The fact that Christ paid for our sins and the Father was satisfied with that payment and accepted that payment as proven by the resurrection of Christ. Paul said in Romans 4.25, He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. He has to be raised again for, to be saved. It's essential to the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without the resurrection of Christ. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. That's hinted at, by, for an example, in Psalm 16. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, he wouldn't see corruption, which would begin to set in on, after four days. He would be raised on the third day. And there's some, uh, you know, there's some um, types of that. I think about Jonah, three days and three nights in the... Uh, the belly of the whale, so cries three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and so on. So it's according to the Scriptures, verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas. The fact he was buried confirms he died. The fact that he was seen confirms he rose again. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Notice Paul is not one of the twelve apostles. He distinguishes himself from the twelve. 
Christ has 12 apostles that he said in Matthew 19, 28 are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He was seeing the 12, and after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. In other words, he's saying 500 at one time saw him after he rose from the dead. And uh, someone, some modernist said one time, well, that was just a hallucination, you know. Well, that's a, that's a great miracle for 500 people to have the same hallucination at the same time. No, they saw him. And he said, look, most of them are still alive. You can go ask them. Eyewitnesses. After that, he was seen of James and of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also. As of one born out of a due time. He, he was seen. Notice that. Verse 5. He was seen. Verse 6. He was seen. Verse 7. He was seen. Verse 8. He was seen. Over 500 eyewitnesses. That, that would hold up in any court of law. That Christ is risen from the dead. My friend, Jesus Christ rising from the dead on the third day is a historical fact. But you've got to trust in your heart. He died for you and rose again to be saved. Acts 1 verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen in them 40 days. He made appearances over a 40 day period uh, before he publicly ascended back to heaven and he gave many infallible proofs. The modern versions water this down severely and change it to say convincing proofs. Well, Infallible is a much stronger word. King James is right. There are many infallible proofs. After he went back to heaven, later, last of all, Paul said he was seen of me. He was seen of me. Christ from heaven made an appearance to the apostle Paul. He was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. As of one born out of due time is just basically saying that not according to the normal course of things. You know, Saul of Tarsus deserved the wrath of God, but he was saved by grace, totally off the prophetic script of what was taking place at that time. God did something new, and something new started whenever he saved Saul of Tarsus. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 um, that uh, he was a pattern. He said that in me first. Talking about when he got saved, in me first. Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should believe hereafter. So he said in verse 9, I am le for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Church of God is a general designation. The context will determine what, what is being referred to. That church in Jerusalem in the early Acts period was an assembly of God's people. Okay, so some people try to say, well, this proves that this dispensation began before Paul's ministry. But you, you have to understand that it's believing the gospel of the grace of God that was revealed to Paul first. It's believing that gospel that puts you in the body of Christ. Peter was not preaching the gospel of the grace of God in Acts 2.38 when he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That was the gospel of the kingdom. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And so, how do you begin this dispensation before the revelation that makes it the dispensation that it is, is dispensed? A dispensation is a dispensing of divine revelation. Paul received the mystery of this age. The mysteries associated with the great mystery of the body of Christ. That was made known to him first. So a church is a called out assembly. Of course there was a called out assembly in Jerusalem, a kingdom church. And it was a church of God, no doubt. Paul said, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Three times we find the word grace in verse 10. What an emphasis on God's amazing grace. And what did it do for Paul? He was saved by grace, but he served God by grace. Being under grace doesn't mean we do nothing. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm saved, so whatever. No, the right attitude, the right heart is, I don't have to do works 
to be saved. I'm saved by grace, but because I'm saved by grace, I willingly serve the Lord. It caused Paul to labor more abundantly than they all. That was what the grace of God did in him. But you look at this thing and you realize that Paul's conversion is one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection of Christ. You can't explain the conversion of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus without the resurrection of Christ. He, he was an enemy of Christ. He was persecuting those that had believed on Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And yet, he believes suddenly and God... Just what an amazing thing he did in Paul is because Paul saw him. I mean, his testimony, his conversion is a great evidence of the resurrection of Christ. There's much evidence for the resurrection of Christ. You know, we, we believe it by faith because we didn't see Christ rise from the dead. But faith is not a leap in the dark. There's a basis. There's no more solid basis than the Word of God, the truth of God. And there's evidence and there's a, a, the basis of the Word of God. And it'd be wise for you to believe the Word of God. It'd be foolish for you to reject the Word of God. God cannot lie. Yes, the resurrection of Christ proves Christianity, distinguishes it, and separates it out from all those false religions. And Paul's conversion is a big evidence in that. Verse number 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. Let me stop and say this. Some people latch on to verse 11 and say, well, there's no difference in the preaching of Peter and Paul. And Paul had the same ministry as the twelve apostles. Because he said, therefore, whether it were I or they, the twelve apostles, so we preach and so you believed. But what he's talking about is the, the preaching of Christ being risen from the dead. All of the apostles preach that Christ is risen from the dead. That doesn't prove they had the same exact ministry because in uh, Acts 2, when Peter preaches that Christ is raised from the dead, by the way, Peter's not glorying in the cross in Acts 2. He's preaching it as a murder indictment on Israel calling on them to repent of that awful deed, saying Christ is risen. Why is he risen in Acts 2 verse 30? To sit on the throne of David. But Paul said in 2 Timothy, 1, uh, 2 Timothy 2 8 that uh, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So Peter preached that Christ is the seed of David and that he's risen from the dead. Paul preached that Christ is the seed of David risen from the dead. Wherein lies the distinction? Well, Peter preached that Christ is going to sit on the throne of David. He's the king of Israel. Paul preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that he's the head of one body. That he's raised to be the head of one body, the new creature. So there's a distinction Verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Well, that could be referring to Greeks. In Acts 17, Paul preaching on Mars Hill, when he preached that Christ was raised, he was mocked. The Greeks mocked, the unbelieving Greeks mocked that. Well, the Sadducees, Matthew 22, 23, for an example, in Acts 23, 8, teaches us that the Sadducees was that sect among the Jews that denied the resurrection. Uh, they denied supernatural things, and uh, they also denied angels and so forth. But, uh, so who was it there? There were people there, religious people there at Corinth, trying to influence this church against what Paul preached, and they were saying there is no resurrection of the dead. Now Paul's going to show them how foolish that is. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? He said, if you're going to deny that there's bodily resurrection, then you're going to have to deny the gospel. Because the gospel is that Christ died for our sins and he was buried and he rose again the third day. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. If Christ is not risen from the dead, He said, what we're preaching is empty. It's vain. It means nothing. And therefore your faith 
is empty. It means nothing. And now we're false witnesses. Now think about that. The New Testament then. Uh, there would be no New Testament because the apostles that God used to write the New Testament, they all preached and emphasized the resurrection of Christ. They would then be false witnesses. Think of the implications of denying bodily resurrection. People want to deny that there's bodily resurrection. My friend, if in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and He did, bodily resurrection is no trouble for Him. Okay, he's God. But there are people still today that are in religion and some even claim to be Christians and then they're going to deny the supernatural and they're going to deny the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of Christ. No, true Christianity, you have to have the virgin born son of God dying on the cross and rising from the dead the third day or we have no salvation. He said, verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you're yet in your sins. Because, again, Romans 4.25, He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. So if He wasn't raised, there is no justification. You're not righteous. You're still in your sins. And if that's the case, you're going to perish. Verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. He said that because they were suffering for preaching the truth. These apostles suffering and being, becoming martyrs for preaching that Christ is raised from the dead. I mean, that proves the reality of it. They, they wouldn't die for a lie. Someone said, well, the Muslims, these suicide bombers, they're dying for a lie. Yeah, but they think they have to do that. They're so deceived, and they think they have to give up their life in order to try to make it to paradise. But Paul taught we're saved by grace. He didn't have to give up his life. He didn't have to die in order to earn salvation. We have salvation because Christ died, not because we die for him, but because he died for us. But they are willing to suffer and die horrible deaths because they knew Christ was risen. They saw him. And that why go through all this suffering? It would be in vain if there is no resurrection. But he makes it crystal clear. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. That's the truth. Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first to rise from the dead to die no more. But there is going to be resurrections to come. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. When you're born in this world of the flesh, you're in Adam. You're going to die. But when you get saved, you're in Christ. You live in Christ. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. There's an order. Uh, Christ that is coming, you have his coming for the body of Christ, the mystery, as we started off at the end of chapter 15. I show you a mystery, the mystery of our resurrection, but then there's a prophesied resurrection at the second coming of Christ. And so there's resurrections to come. There's also the resurrection of the damned after the thousand years at the great white throne judgment, the second death. You notice he says in verse 24, then cometh the end. So here's a thousand year gap. He talked about the coming of Christ, then cometh the end. He reigns a thousand years. And of course of his kingdom there shall be no end. There's a thousand year interval because there has to be a final battle with Satan dissolving the heavens and earth with fire Making new heaven, new earth. Of course, whenever he dissolves the heavens and the earth with fire, you read it in Revelation 20, there is that issue of the great white throne judgment, the judgment on the lost of all the ages. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign. He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And that is... Going to happen when death and hell is cast in the lake of fire, Revelation 20, after the thousand years. Now, he's already abolished death. He's already given us the victory over death. But after this point, 
in Revelation 20. After that great white throne judgment, there will be no more death. Well, I can go on and on in this chapter. What a wonderful chapter. <laughs> I love it. But our time is up. I've gone on. I don't even know how long I've been going now. I lost track. Uh, but there's 58 verses, so we're not going all the way through it. But we dealt with the bulk of it. We have victory over death. Do you know for sure that if you died today, that you'd be with the Lord? You can know that. And you can know that when Christ comes, if you're alive when He comes, you'll be caught up and changed. You can know that you have victory over death. You could know it because God cannot lie and God cannot fail. Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. You have to know you're a lost sinner. You can't save yourself. You deserve death and hell for your sins. That's the bad news. You're a sinner and you deserve death and hell for your sins. The good news is Christ died for our sins. He was buried and He rose again. If you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and put all your trust in Him, you'll have eternal life as a free gift. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't trusted Christ, do it today before it's too late. Thank you, dear Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you for the victory we have over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth of what we considered in your word today. Use it in the hearts of all who've listened. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.